This video is for chapter 3.2, all about chromosomes. So we know that chromosomes house DNA, and DNA is ubiquitous. All types of cells have DNA, including both eukaryotes and prokaryotes. But the chromosomes formed from that DNA are a little bit different in both types of cells. So let's talk about prokaryotes first. In prokaryotes, um, they have one single continuous loop. Um, their chromosome is circular, and it's often referred to as a naked chromosome or naked DNA, and that's because it doesn't contain histones, so it's not wrapped around those proteins like in a eukaryotic cell. And finally, it doesn't come in pairs. It's singular, and that's because these are the result of asexual reproduction. And in prokaryotes, of course, we call that binary fission, it does not involve the fusion of gametes, which is what um, causes the pairs in eukaryotes. Now, that single circular chromosome isn't the only spot where we might find DNA in a prokaryote. Um, some bacterial cells also contain these things called plasmids, which are small loops of DNA. They're kind of like an accessory DNA. So just to do a review of uh, the prokaryotic structure, let's go ahead and draw one. I like to start with the cell membrane, and of course you can call that the plasma membrane if you prefer. Just outside of that is the cell wall. All prokaryotes have a cell wall. It's not made of the same uh, substance as plant cell walls, so plant cell walls are made up of cellulose. This is made up of peptidoglycan. Some prokaryotes on the outside of that might have another layer called a capsule, but not all of them have that, so I'm going to leave that off for now. And let's see, all prokaryotes have ribosomes. All right, now when you're drawing that, you want to make sure that they're evenly distributed and that you have a bunch of them. And then all prokaryotes have a single loop of DNA. So even though it's kind of like all twisted around, you want to make sure that it ends up being all one loop. So imagine one loop of stuff all tangled together. And this is, of course, the DNA. And you might refer to this region as the nucleoid region. Nucleoid. Okay, since there's no nucleus, just the area where that DNA hangs out is called the nucleoid. Some prokaryotes might have a flagella for movement, not all, but some. And then some prokaryotes, again, are going to have these smaller things sticking out from the outside, and these are called pili. Pili is plural, pilus would be singular, and pili are so cool. They are these tubes that bacteria can kind of hook up to another bacterial cell, and through those pili, that bridge that they form with their pili, they can exchange these things called plasmids, and these plasmids are those small circular loops of accessory DNA, and so bacterial cells can kind of swap plasmids with other bacterial cells by forming a bridge uh, with their pili. On the contrast, eukaryote cr uh, chromosomes are quite different. So first of all, they are wrapped, the DNA is wrapped around these histone proteins. Okay, those histone proteins form, nu form nucleosomes. They then condense upon each other to form a chromatin fiber. During prophase of mitosis, that chromatin fiber is going to supercoil and condense into these chromosome structures. Instead of being a single loop, okay, we like to say that these chromosomes are linear, okay, so not a loop, and they all come in pairs, one from each parent. All right, so let's just kind of put this down into a label here. So, of course, we have the DNA, and DNA is wrapped around these proteins called histone proteins. Remember, prokaryotes don't have those. And the structure that results when DNA wraps around this histone protein, it's going to wrap around it twice. 
That is called a nucleosome. Now, it's kind of hard to tell from this picture, but when a bunch of those nucleosomes kind of condense upon each other, we get a fiber called chromatin. And chromatin is going to be the form that the DNA is in for most of the cell's life because this is the um, form that the DNA is in during interphase. We only get these structures called chromosomes, of course, during mitosis. So why do we bother forming chromosomes? Well, because you have to remember how a chromosome is structured. So each half of this chromosome is called a sister chromatid, and these are exact copies. Well, one copy needs to go into one new cell, and the other one needs to go into the other daughter cell. If we leave it like this as chromatin, it's going to be hard to make sure that those copies uh, each make it into each new cell. And don't forget, in humans, we have 23 pairs of these things. So there's a lot of crap in there that we want to make sure that we get organized. This, of course, happens in prophase. Okay? And so in prophase, we're going from chromatin to these chromosome structures. Now, remember that you were the result of the fusion of an egg with a sperm. And that single fertilized egg is called a zygote, and it contains all of the DNA that you're ever going to have. Well, after conception, that zygote is going to start multiplying, multiplying, multiplying. So we're going to go to two, from two to four, from four to eight, and then eventually to the trillions of cells that make up your body. So all of the cells in your body contain a complete and identical set of DNA. So why do your skin cells look different from your tongue cells? Well, that's because not all of the genes that are contained in that DNA are expressed. Okay, so remember that we need some genes to be turned on and we need other genes to be turned off. So if you're a skin cell, you want all of the genes that help you be a skin cell turned on and you want all of the genes that tell something how to be a liver cell to be turned off. So this happens in a variety of ways, including hormones and all these other transcription factors, etc. But histones are actually really helpful in that also because they can help to wrap those sections of DNA real tightly so that enzymes can't get in there to transcribe and translate them. And if they can't get transcribed and translated, the protein that that gene codes for can't get made and then that gene can't get expressed. Okay, so here's a look at um, a human cell. So human cells have 46 chromosomes, and of course they come in pairs, one from the mom and one from the dad, and that's because we're the result of sexual reproduction. So the egg is going to contain one copy of each of those 23 chromosomes, and the sperm is going to contain one copy of each of those 23 chromosomes. And when those gametes fuse during fertilization, okay, they're going to come together, and that's where we get our 23 pairs. And we call those pairs homologous, okay? Homo meaning same, okay? So when we say the same, we mean that in a homologous pair, where we have one from the mom, one from the dad, they have the same genes in the same location, okay? So that's what it means to be homologous. This and this are not homologous. They don't contain the same genes. So homologous pairs contain the same genes in the same location. Now, they may not be the same alleles. For instance, this one might have uh, an allele for type A blood, and this one might have an allele for type O blood, but those genes will be present in the same place and um, on the same chromosome. And that's what it means to be a homologous pair. So what I just showed you was a homologous pair not in replication, okay? So homologous pairs, again, one from the dad, one from the mom. But what we have to remember is that at some point, we're going to undergo the S phase and interphase and replicate that material. So the homologous pairs are then going to 
replicate. So the mom is going to replicate and the dad is going to replicate. And usually when I'm looking at homologous pairs, okay, I'm going to be looking at some kind of duplicated situation, okay? So still homologous pairs, but these are in replicated form. So if we're looking at a cell and we can clearly see that those homologous chromosomes are there, that the chromosomes are in pairs, then this is what we call a diploid cell. And we abbreviate diploid cell by saying 2N, where N is the number of chromosomes. Okay, so in humans, we have 23 different types of chromosomes. In a diploid cell, we would have two of each of those for a total of 46 chromosomes. This is how our chromosomes are going to be present in like our what we call somatic cells, which are just our body cells. So a skin cell, an intestinal cell, a kidney cell, a liver cell, etc. These are all produced by mitosis. And um, again, we should be finding those in the homologous pairs. So something like this, maternal and paternal DNA together. Haploid cells really just refers to our gametes, and we call those N, again, where N is the number of chromosomes. These are the cells that are produced by not mitosis, but meiosis. We'll talk more about that in the next chapter. And this is when chromosomes are not in pairs. Okay, so a haploid looks like this, where we don't have both the maternal and paternal DNA. We just have one or the other. So I keep referencing humans, right? I'm, very, I'm being very human-centric here, and I keep saying that our chromosome number is 46. Um, and that's because chromosome number is one of the defining characteristics of a species. So with few genetic um, abnormalities, all humans are going to have 46 chromosomes. All rats have 42. All fen ducks have 80. All watermelons have 22. Okay, so that chromosome number is one of those um, consistent defining characteristics of each type of organism. Now, the way that we get this word chromosome is actually pretty interesting. Chromo means color, and some means body. It literally translates into colored body, which you can see um, down here. So to get an image like this, we expose these uh, pieces of genetic material, these chromosomes, to different dyes. And these dyes allow us to see the different sizes and shapes and sort them by length. So to produce this image, we just take those colored bodies. Trust me, when you get this image at first in the cell, these are all mixed up. We just put them together in order of size, and then we match up the homologous pairs, kind of like matching up socks. This picture is called a karyogram. Okay, so gram meaning like picture, like graph, like I think of Instagram. Okay, so that's a picture. A karyotype, okay, is something different. Karyotype is almost like a diagnosis. So I would say that the karyotype is that this is a human because there's 23 pairs and it's also a female because it has two X chromosomes. So a karyotype are assumptions about that organism that I'm making based on this picture called the karyogram. Now I reference the karyotype of that individual as being a female. Well, how did I know? Well, that's because females for their 23rd pair have two X's, okay? Males will have two, or sorry, one X and a Y. So the first 22 chromosomes are what we call autosomes. They contain all kinds of uh, different genes that are relevant to both males and females. But for sex determination, I'm just interested in that 23rd pair. Two X's for a female, okay? Two, uh, sorry, one X and a Y for male. So, What's the probability that two people uh, have a baby and that that baby is a girl? Well, to do that, let's do a Punnett square. So a Punnett square is going to look something like this. Okay, I'm going to write the possible genotypes of the gametes for the mother across the top. So if a mother has two X's and she produces two eggs, 
one of those eggs is going to have this x and one of those eggs is going to have this x. So I write each egg possibility. You don't have to draw the egg, but I'm just doing that for effect um, above the top. When this male is producing sperm, these chromosomes are going to separate. Half the sperm are going to have this X. Half the sperm are going to have this Y. So literally, the sperm are going to be half X, half Y. The insides of the Punnett square represent the fusion of these chromosomes. So they represent the uh, genotype or genes based on the fertilization of whatever um, you're cross-referencing here. So here I'm going to have two X's, an X from the mom and an X from the dad. Same thing over here. Okay, so these are both going to be girls. So I will like very sexist e <laughs> circle those in pink. Okay, so those are going to be a girl. Down here, okay, this X and this Y are going to fuse. And the same thing here. And so these are going to be boys or males. So the probability um, of having a girl is always one half. In this case, two out of four. Okay, but that can be reduced to one half or 50%. And it is actually the male that determines the gender because the female is always donating an X. The only difference between the boys and the girls is whether the father donates an X or the father donates a Y. So if you and your partner have a baby together and you don't like the gender of the baby, uh, it's definitely the male partner's fault. Okay, so what gender is this? Well, first of all, I know not to look at any of the first 22 chromosomes because those are the autosomes. I wanna look at the 23rd pair, that sex chromosome, and I can see that I've got an X and an X. Okay, this is a female. A male is going to look more like this, okay? So in that 23rd pair, here's the X, it's just not duplicated. And then I can tell this is a Y because the Y chromosome is much smaller. So this is an X and this is a Y. Y chromosomes are very much smaller. So this is a human male. Well, actually, it's not human. What am I thinking? Because this uh, doesn't have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Well, whatever this thing is, is a male. All right, so remember that the picture uh, that we're getting here is called a karyogram, okay? The karyotype is going to be some inferences that I can make uh, based upon this. So again, we know this is a human, and I can tell that this is a male, so an X and a Y chromosome, that little one here. But I can also tell that there's something a little funky here because notice that each of these are in homologous pairs, pairs meaning two, except for this one. Okay, so how, how do we know all of this? Okay, well, all of these images that we get of DNA that help us to understand how cells replicate and store their genetic information originated from a process called autoradiography, which sounds crazy, but it's not if you break it down. So graph, meaning some kind of image or picture like photograph, radio, meaning radioactive, and auto, meaning self. Okay, so a self radioactive image. Okay, well, that's exactly what auto radiography is. Auto radiography is when we can produce images of radioactive substances. So when you grow DNA in a radioactive medium, okay, uh, it will start to produce its own images when you put it under certain types of light. So when you do that, you can actually see how that single loop of bacterial DNA kind of comes unzipped and makes a new copy of itself. And that's how um, we have originally um, started determining the length of DNA strands, how prokaryotic chromosomes replicate, what that process looked like. Uh, so there's a really important step in understanding the structure and uh, function of those chromosomes. And that'll do it for chapter 3.2 on chromosomes.